Just wanted to introduce myself. I am Serena Thomas. I'm Programs Director at Homewood Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us to learn more about rapid rehousing from our panel of experts. I'll be helping us keep on track this morning so we can cover the material and have time for everyone's questions before we end. To start, I will introduce Linda Nuss. She's our Operations Director at Homewood Alliance, and she's going to facilitate the panel discussion. Would you like to start, Linda? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming. Um, as Serena mentioned, we're gonna try to move through this um, as quickly as we can so that we can get all the questions in and then have uh, time for additional questions at the end as well. Um, how we're gonna do this is, I, I did send out the agenda and it kind of had a description of the um, agency's um, bios, that sort of thing on there to, to shorten what we have to do here up front so that um, everyone can kind of see who's who is presenting and a little bit about their organization. But for now, um, let's just have uh, Carrie and Jesse and Christina and Betsy all introduce themselves just so that everyone can put a face with a name as we go through this. So um, yeah, so Betsy, I see you first popped up. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, so I'm Betsy Sullivan. I'm the Regional Manager for Volunteers of America, our Veteran and Supportive Services Programs, and currently I oversee four rapid rehousing programs. Okay, thanks. And then Jesse, you want to go next? Yeah, hi. I'm Jesse Kohlauer. I'm with Alternatives to Violence as the Non-Residential Program Manager and oversee our housing program. Okay. And Carrie. I'm Carrie Clark, Executive Director of Alternatives to Violence. I oversee everything here, but have also worked really closely, excuse our phone's ringing, uh, with Jesse on our housing program, including um, increasing our rapid rehousing program. Okay, and Christina. I am Christina Minio. I am the sole rapid rehousing case manager at the moment uh, for Homeowner Alliance. All right. Thanks, all. Um, so I think what we'll do is I'll just, every time, as I go through the questions, and in a minute here, I'll just kind of go through what rapid, the definition of rapid rehousing, but um, just to kind of give an idea of how this might roll out, um, we'd like to be able to give all three organizations um, the ability to um, answer the questions, but if you could kind of keep it to a two-minute-ish um, um, time frame that would be great so that we can get through them all and then Jesse and Carrie I don't know if you I, I don't think we'll have time to have you both answer it so um, you all might have to just pick one or the other as we go through that thank you Linda you yeah we decided Jesse would answer most questions if they pertain at all to any kind of administrative um, and financial aspects I can hop in but we'll mostly count on okay. it yeah, that sounds good. And then I thought, you know, also it may be that somebody covers covers the question so well that the other two agencies might not have a ton to add, you know, to add or whatever. So um, it may go faster than we think, but we just want to make sure that we can get through it all. So um, for those of you who um, aren't familiar with rapid rehousing, um, it's a program that um, that provides short term rental assistance and services and it's to help people try to obtain housing quickly um, and get um, to be self-sufficient and try to relieve the like short-term um, or smaller barriers that people face um, that would lead them into a homelessness type situation. So um, it's it's quick a quick assistance um, and only meant to um, to last a certain amount of time. So it's offered without um, preconditions like. You, such as income, absence of criminal record, um, employment, sobriety, um, and the resources are provided um, and tailored to the, the needs of a person or family. So that's that's a condensed definition of it, um, but we'll find out more as we go through these questions. So, okay, so we'll go ahead and get right into the questions then. Question number one, um, uh, Betsy, I'll call on you first um, to answer this. Um, does the standard definition of rapid rehousing match how your agency operates? If not, what are the deviations and why? So um, we actually push it a little bit further. Um, the, we do operate that way, but we do very intensive wraparound case management. 
And two of the programs have additional supports of a therapist and also um, somebody who does benefits for them. Um, and right now, just because of the pandemic, um, the, the limitations in terms of how much we can give people has really been ongoing. We haven't had to um, cut it down, but typically it is limited in the amount of money that we can give. Thank you. Um, uh, Jesse, you want to go next? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, this is pretty standard for the folks that we serve also. Um, there, there are no pre-requirements. I mean, outside of the SPDAD and um, having folks in that rapid rehousing range, uh, we're not going to ask for, for much more outside of that to qualify for the program. Um, we just have to do, the only thing that as ATV we have to do is make sure that um, uh, if, if, they're, um, if they come to us and uh, there's a conflict of interest, um, if, they're, if their perpetrator potentially was somebody that we serve, we wouldn't be able to serve them. But that's generally an internal agency uh, challenge that we mediate and usually when it's an outside referral. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Um, Christina, that leaves you. Yeah, um, so our program is pretty general. Um, we have, serve a wide range of individuals that we can accept. Um, we don't have any preconditions when enrolling somebody into the program. Um, I can't speak for all rapid rehousing programs, but um, we don't have any of the, uh, we don't have any preconditions as far as like enrollment, any employment or um, income caps or anything like that. Um, it's pretty much just almost anybody and everybody that we can accept into our program. Okay. All right, we'll go on to question number two. And I'll just add, you know, if people have questions, um, just write them down and at the end, we'll, we'll throw them out there and um, just, you know, you can write down whatever question it's associated with. So we'll handle all those additional questions at the end. Um, okay, so what are the biggest challenges to implementing a rapid rehousing program? Uh, Christina, you wanna go first on this one? Sure, um, I can speak from a direct service provider uh, point of view. Um, I think the biggest challenge comes from, honestly, the ones that write and distribute the grants. Um, it seems to me that a number of the policies and guidelines in the grants are really out of touch with, with what's considered effective or like best practice. Um, case managers do spend a lot of time navigating around various policies because they don't fit within the scope of the program's like ultimate goal. Um, housing programs like this need to be flexible and they need to have some sort of flexibility and that can sometimes be difficult to obtain. Um, not every program in every area can operate the same, like a program in Northern Colorado might operate completely differently than a program in like Omaha or New York City or something like that. Um, there, there's a lot of factors that can create challenges when implementing um, a housing program too. And that should be kept in mind when developing these programs on a national level. Um, you, a lot of the programs that we have you know, stem from uh, stem from some department on a national level like HUD or the VA or anything like that. Um, so it's really, you got to keep that in mind when implementing a program is that everywhere is going to be different. And um, any, any barriers that um, can be put in place or no, any lack of flexibility that can really um, take away from the time that we have to assist clients in the long run. Okay, thanks, Christina. Carrie? Oh, sorry, Jesse? <laughs> Both Jesse and I can, but I'll let Jesse start on that. <laughs> yeah, to kind of piggyback off of Christina there, um, the, the grantors, uh, it, it's challenging because they're, they're not the boots on the ground, so to speak. And um, the biggest qualm I, I have is with HUD. Um, and a lot of the requirements as far, as far as paperwork is concerned. Um, the rent reasonableness, I know that the, um, 
there's been a lot of waivers that have been in place that has been very helpful for, for helping us get folks into housing quickly. So we haven't had to abide by FMRs, which is great. Um, that being said, I mean, the rent reasonableness in and of itself is, um, uh, for those that don't know, you just have to compare the unit that we're putting a client in to three units that honestly just cost more um, in the respective area. That being said, sometimes the units that are available for our clients are those most costly ones because that's the landlord that said, you know what, we will take your client with an extensive criminal history, a lower background check, et cetera, et cetera, when we can't find somebody else to do that and with eviction as well. So that that would be my sticking point, along with just the um, the <laughs> the excessive use of paperwork involved um, with uh, uh, from start to finish from intake. There is a paper trail a mile long, so that's just a pain point I have overall. And Linda, if I could just piggyback onto Jesse, there part of uh, challenge to implementing it too is that rapid rehousing programs are come from different funding sources, so they may be different particular. Uh, policies and procedures. So if you have two different funding sources, one may be ESG, the other one might be a COC funded rapid rehousing. You just have to be very cognizant of the policies and procedures that go along with each, as well as developing your own policy and procedures, which is required. Great, thank you. All right, Betsy? So my experience uh, hasn't been quite the same. Um, I have three different funders and I have found all of them to be responsive to quest or concerns that we have about how the program operates. And eventually they will adjust what they're doing. Um, however, I don't think HUD is the same. <laughs> I think HUD is a little bit different. Um, so for me, I think the biggest challenge with rapid rehousing, especially having done it over the last 10 years and implementing the program was initially getting people to understand that it can work and um, that it's not just a Band-Aid. I think the initial rapid rehousing that they, they did really was a Band-Aid because they didn't really do case management. Um, and I think that the case management piece is really the most important part of that. Um, and also I think, um, working with landlords and them understanding that it's not an ongoing um, rental subsidy. That's also kind of been a challenge. And then, um, you know, just uh, again, the pandemic, I think, was a huge challenge in terms of rapid rehousing as well, just in terms of requirements that were, were there. So uh, that's really what I, I would say. And that and, and hiring really good quality people who will stay for a long time because it's really hard work. It's really, really hard work for the case managers. Okay. Thank you, Betsy. All right. Uh, let's see here. My screen keeps flopping back and forth. Hold on one second. Okay. Uh, share a success story at your agency that uh, typifies the rapid rehousing model and why it worked in this situation. Uh, Jesse, you want to go first on this one? Yeah, we've had a couple different folks who have, um, through through the time of being in the program and, and being in housing, who have got connected to therapists, gotten connected to um, your guys' um, Homeward Alliance's uh, resource navigators, and um, worked on uh, receiving certification through that program um, that then, you know, moved them to a... a, a plateau of stability um, that wasn't there prior to their housing um, and when we initially received them. Um, and it's been great having the resource navigators here as well, um, having them be able to just sit down. And uh, obviously the, the more um, resources we can throw at a household to help them in their stability goals, um, the better they'll be. But that, and that's been a couple different households. I don't, I don't wanna speak to one necessarily over the other. That's just been a general trend. Thanks. All right, Christina. Yeah, uh, same goes for a lot of our clients. Um, we spend a lot of time connecting all of our clients with resources. We don't just house them and then kind of, you know, leave them to their own devices. 
um, we spend a lot of time connecting them with different resources so that they can succeed. Um, if you look at the way our program is written, it is very much get them housed, get them stable quickly. Um, and if you're looking for um, if you're looking for an ideal scenario where that happened, um, we do have uh, a young man that was in a shelter with his brother and they had been homeless for quite some time. And um, we were able to get them housed. The one of them was working, the other one was not. And in a very short period of time, I'd say over three, four months, um, both of them were became completely employed. So they were full-time, uh, they gained full-time employment and they are now completely self-sustainable. So they will be exited from our program. And so as far as being rapid in the housing and then becoming self-sustainable in a short period of time, they are uh, the perfect example of how our program is meant to be implemented and um, the time frame that you know we're hoping to work with. They far uh, exceeded what a lot of people have done or can do. So that's that's a good example. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Betsy? Sure. So um, when we first started the program, we had a man who came in to us. He had really severe PTSD um, and had been deployed several times, and he had, was fleeing domestic violence with his three daughters, his three teenage daughters. And when they came in, uh, he just couldn't do anything because the girls were always fighting and, and having kind of a, you know, they didn't want to be in a shelter. Um, so we were able with our funding that we had to put the girls in a camp for a week. He found housing. Uh, he looked for housing during that time, got into an apartment um, and found a job all within a week, got housed and was doing great and was out of our program within a couple of months. So it was a really good example of, of how it worked. And the programs also, our programs, um, really allow for us to pay for any housing activity or anything that will stabilize housing. So putting the girls in the camp was a, a housing stabilization kind of activity that we were actually able to do, which was really great. And that was through our uh, VA grant. Um, the other grants will allow some of those things as well. But that's a really good example of how quickly it worked and how well it worked. Great, thank you so much. All right, next question. Share an example of a time when the rapid rehousing process didn't work or wasn't an appropriate intervention in a given situation and how the household was served. Um, Betsy, you wanna go on this one first? Sure, I think this is probably something that we've all experienced. Um, I think when we get somebody whose needs are just too high um, and they really need something like permanent supportive housing. Um, so our program, we give the dignity of trying um, and we'll continue to work with them, but oftentimes it's really clear up front that they need more intensive services. And so what we will do is we will coordinate services with other agencies or we'll work with our coordinated entry system, CAPS, um, to get them a voucher. Um, we do something, we all do something called the VI SPDAT, which um, determines vulnerability for someone, but it's not a scientific tool and it doesn't always work perfectly. So we are able, if we need to advocate for people when um, th their needs are just too high. I will say that rapid rehousing can work for chronically homeless people. And I've seen it work before very well. Um, they just needed a chance, but for some people they need more support and so we work to get them a voucher and work with all of the other resources in the community. I will say it's a very, very collaborative community um, across all of Northern Colorado. People really, um, we're all working with the same folks who come in and out of our offices. Thanks, Betsy. Okay, Jesse. Yeah, um, Betsy pretty much covered all of it, but, um, a couple things, you know, something that we, we see, and I'm, I'm sure other folks do as well, is we have a lot of folks that are coming from a pretty traumatic background. And <clears throat> um, unfortunately, the, the mental health um, challenges they have from being in that trauma for so long, it, it's hard for them to get out. And while rapid rehousing can be 
anywhere from three months to two years of subsidy. Sometimes these folks need even more than that. And um, for, for people that are not able to go out into the community and get employment because they're, they're so fearful um, or not able to move forward in their lives, uh, you know, they need a lot more intensive therapy services before that's effective for them. Um, the, those are the folks that we struggle with the most is the ones that have these mental health challenges that are, aren't letting them progress forward. Um, but our subsidy is not going to be suitable for them. And that's where we struggle the most. Um, we were very blessed when vouchers came out last year, um, specifically for rapid, rehou rapid rehousing households that were not proving to be successful in the program. Um, and that was great. And I think every year that should happen. All right, thanks, Jesse. Uh, Christina. Yeah, I, I completely agree with everything that Betsy and Jesse said. Um, first and foremost, like our program in particular, we have to accept people that are that score between a four and a seven on the VI SPDAT. And the VI SPDAT, um, anybody that works with it knows it's not necessarily a reliable tool to determine whether somebody will be successful um, in a rapid rehousing program, unfortunately. Um, we do have a number of people in our program, and our program's fairly new too, um, that were referred and screened. And when you explain the program to them, um, you know, they hear housing and they're just like, yes, I want to do that. I can do the work and whatnot. Um, as time progresses, you do see those traumas come out and you do see um, a number of barriers that maybe weren't presented before or weren't really identified before. Um, and so it's, it's, it's our job to then really figure out is rapid rehousing the best, you know, uh, the best program for them. And if not, what else is out there that, you know, can provide longer term support. So it's not like we just kind of say, well, rapid rehousing is not for you uh, and just drop them on somebody else's doorstep. We really work with them, um, with the clients to ensure their long-term stability. And we walk them through it until the very end and then do a warm handoff with whatever program they might be, re, you know, enrolling into or, you know, anything like that. So there's, there are a lot of, a lot of instances where rapid rehousing just isn't for somebody and that's okay. As long as, you know, there is community collaboration and, and as long as we can really work together to identify um, a solution instead of just saying this program's not for you, have a nice day. Uh, I think that that's, that's key. All right, thank you. All right, uh, next question. The current housing market is highly competitive, expensive, and with low vacancy rates. How do you help people secure housing in this environment? Do you have any suggestions for addressing this issue at a community level? Uh, Christina, you want to take this one first? So happy you asked. Um, personally, I always let clients know how the housing market is up front. Um, and in Larimer County in particular, there has been uh, a huge increase in housing costs, not just for buyers, but for renters. Um, that can greatly limit the number of affordable housing options there are for people. Um, other barriers that might get in the way that I have really noticed, um, and I think a lot of the case managers have noticed, is um, just landlords creating those barriers, unfortunately. Um, one way we're able to kind of work around it and help people secure housing is by fostering relationships with the landlords. There are some really wonderful landlords out there um, who are willing to work with us and our clients because we spend a lot of time earning their trust and really working with them and communicating with them so that they know that we're not just going to put somebody in housing and just disappear. Um, and then they're stuck with, you know, whatever there is. Um, I think that that's, that's a big, a big proponent in helping people stay in housing longer and, you know, allowing those people to, or people experiencing homeless, homelessness, um, allowing them to get into housing easier because there are a lot of uh, landlords that I've run into that do not think that people experiencing homelessness are ideal candidates um, for housing. 
as far as suggestions on how to address this issue on a community level, um, one thing I noticed that is lacking is being educated on fair housing and um, the new laws that have been enacted within just the state of Colorado alone. Um, there's a number of landlords that we have run into also that feel the law is open to interpretation, which just creates um, more barriers and um, they're able to find loopholes basically so as not to house one of those less than ideal you know candidates um, so if communities could work together on trying to maybe destigmatize um, people experiencing homelessness and support low-income housing projects um, maybe providing landlord incentives for people to you know take on uh, people experiencing homelessness that maybe don't have good credit or a good rental history. Um, I think those are all good starting points to really kind of curb this issue. Thanks, Christina. Uh, Betsy? Yeah, so I think relationships are really key um, to helping people secure housing. Honestly, if you have somebody who has you know, criminal justice involvement and is mentally ill, it's going to take um, a lot of effort to get them housed, um, especially if their background is check is pulled. And so having good relationships is very, very important. And, and landlords knowing that you're going to follow through on what you say you're going to do and that, you, you know, if you're still doing case management, that's a huge part of it. Um, suggestions I have for addressing this issue at a community level is, um, you know, I agree with Christina, we definitely have to educate our community better on what it means to be homeless. And just because a person does not have housing does not mean they're a bad person who is going to do bad things. Um, the other thing is that, uh, you know, these are people who want to be paying their taxes. And we have so many successful stories of people who no longer need the support and they're working and they're successful. Um, in their homes across all of Northern Colorado. And I think the other thing we need to do is really start talking with our legislators and our policymakers, um, the city, <coughs> city councils, police departments, that kind of thing, in terms of educating about our programs, why they're there and what they're for. The other thing that I would love to see is communities, um, whether it's city councils or uh, local government, I what other local government is really creating uh, like a landlord fund for any kind of issues that might come up that um, some agencies might not be able to provide for. So a good example would be meth mitigation. Um, some landlords are not able to get um, insurance for people who may cook meth in their homes. That's a very toxic environment to be in. It's a huge amount of money to clean it up. Um, so I'd love to see more types of funding for things like that, or just somebody who damages an apartment. We do a lot of paying double deposits and trying to get creative with different things like pet deposits and cleaning and that kind of a thing for some of um, my programs. So um, I think just bigger community discussions is what we need to have on this and, and what it looks like. Thanks, Bitsy. All right, Jesse. This is a soapbox of mine. Um, the The housing market currently is a it's a landlord's market. So, um, you know, they uh, even next to someone like myself, I'm probably going to be with you know three other people that are going to look at a place. So the challenge for us is how do we make our clients more marketable? Um, than these other folks, right? And I can't even express how how much the double deposit is so helpful. Um, mostly because even the people that have good credit and a, a stable job and good rental history, most of the time they can't afford to put up a double deposit right away. And so that automatically escalates our clients to make, make them more marketable compared to these other folks. Um, Having Betsy, I, I really love what you said about the um, the pot of funding. You know that city council and community leaders need to be having that conversation for for landlord incentives, and that was one thing I saw in um, the ESGCV funding is the incentives for landlords that were available. I was, you know, 
I was very excited about that. I wish that was available in, in all the funding sources kind of across the board. The fact that it could be three times the contract rent, I mean, that's, that's more than a double deposit, obviously. Um, and that's amazing. It should have been offered um, standard across the board and not when a pandemic hit, uh, in my mind personally. In Northern Colorado too, having folks really having that conversation, of course, everybody wants to live in Larimer County. Um, in uh, you know, at the base of the Rocky Mountains, et cetera, but really having those honest discussions with clients about maybe not limiting yourself to um, where you're looking for housing. Now we are we are blessed at ATV to um, have the ability to house people in Wells County or Larimer County, but having those discussions, I I know Greeley's got a bad rep, and it, unfortunately, um, sometimes it's easier to get them housed there. There is a property manager that is over there that will accept people with evictions, um, with people and landlords that are willing to look above that kind of stuff. It's great. But then at the same time, without us being there, there are some pieces. Um, and I, I, I certainly don't want to um, talk bad, but sometimes they also use that as a, a, a way to uh, a way to treat the clients terribly um, and not fix things and, and not do things. And if it wasn't for us advocating for them and checking in on them, I'm not sure if those things would be done. And a lot of the landlords too, they, they see vouchers as a pain point. And I know this is a discussion of rapid rehousing, but one thing that they love so much um, and feedback I've gotten is we're not just putting them in and leaving them there. And I think Christina had kind of mentioned that, you know, we're not leaving them there to do with what they will. There's a, a uh, point person for landlords to contact if challenges do arise. And for our landlord obligations, we have what the landlord's supposed to do, but we also list out what, what our job is, like what we're giving them in response to that as well. Um, and it, it tends to work out better because people with vouchers, they don't have those wraparound services. Um, and that's why I personally love rapid rehousing more. Thanks, Jesse. You know, it's obviously a loaded question. Lots to talk about there. So I kept it succinct, Linda. I kept it succinct. No, no, it was fine. It's fine. We were really, we're really good on time. So, um, like I said, that's kind of a loaded question, and it's great information. So, uh, that's great. Um, all right. So we'll move on to the last one now. Um, how would you recommend community members support your rapid rehousing program? Uh, Christina, you want to go first? Sure. Um, along with, like I said, you know, educating landlords um, on the law and things like that. I think honestly, I think having some sort of learning session or listening session or something like that for community members, which I know is done on some level, um, where they have a chance to become more educated on the homelessness community, um, maybe learn about the resources that are available to assist those that are experiencing homelessness, um, learning how to be more trauma-informed, um, things like that I think would be beneficial um, on a community level. Um, I think by doing so there may be some people who are private landlords or um, know a landlord or, you know, might be one themselves that um, who might become more open to working with rapid rehousing programs once they know uh, more about it, because it's easy to kind of explain in a roundabout way what it is, but without really going into detail, you don't have, um, you don't have the whole picture, more or less. Um, and so I think people are really hesitant to do so. So I think that if you have um, some sort of learning session or something of the like that you know, you can take that time and explain all of the facets of, you know, the homelessness community and what's available and what these programs actually do. I think that um, while also educating on fair housing and the laws implemented in Colorado, I think those are key too, um, because I don't think a lot of people are actually educated um, in that. I think that could be very beneficial for the community as a whole, but also, um, for people that, you know, especially landlords that, you know, might want to help and support our rapid rehousing programs. Thanks, Christina. All right, Jesse. 
yeah, I mean, a lot of the same stuff that Christina just said, um, having those conversations. I know as community members um, and not being in the housing world necessarily, it, it's hard to see all these different nuances. Um, and without being uh, completely obnoxious and saying, well, if you could send our agencies checks and earmark it for housing, that'd be great. Um, I, but shameless plug, sorry. However, um, we, we were very blessed um, to have somebody approach us and, and, and Carrie did make this connection for us that a, a group had mentioned, you know, we really want to support ATV. What, what is that? What is your biggest need? And it, it was our housing. It's our housing clients because we have them for so long. There's so many needs that come up in the meantime, and we don't have um, the funding uh, in, in our grants that comes with the supportive services, right? We, we've had to tailor and use them a little bit differently, but the housing needs that come up and, and stabilizing a household can look like so many different things. I mean, Betsy mentioned sending daughters to camp. Um, the biggest thing for us has always been um, repairs for vehicles, um, certifications as well for pieces like that. Um, there's just so many needs that, I mean, most, most things can be wordsmithed into stabilizing housing. Um, just about, uh, there's, there's not too many things that, that won't qualify. Um, so, I mean, that being said, I mean, community members for, for those that want to help and support, I would say, talk to, talk to your city council, talk to your community leaders and express to them, you know, the, the need for that, the need for that support, you know, the grants that we get for rental dollars are, are, are a lot, you know, it's not the rental piece that we need. Um, assistance with it's all the other stuff outside of housing that we would um, benefit them. Thanks, Jesse and Betsy. I would uh, recommend really um, educating and advocating with community leaders because I think people are inclined to listen to our community leaders. And when you have somebody in your community who is beginning to talk about it and share this information, it can really make a difference. Um, I think in some areas, it's much easier than others. And um, it's just something that has to keep happening. It's not kind of a one and done sort of deal. You have to continue to educate and continue to have these conversations. <coughs> um, and, you know, I want to give a shout out to Allison because <laughs> Allison is one of those people in her community who has really made things happen by having those conversations with community leaders and um, continuing to do that. So, um, and there's been a lot of progress over the years from, from the time I've known her until now, and she's just tires, tirelessly sort of plugged away at this. And when you have people in your community who do that, the more you can get on board with that and, and really work towards educating your community leaders about why rapid rehousing is important or just housing in general is important, um, affordable housing, um, you're gonna get a lot farther. Um, and just continuing you know, these community conversations, they're, they're just really helpful to have. New people come in to your community all the time. I think there's sometimes this idea that people don't want somebody from another county to move into their county, well, people have the freedom of choice. They can move wherever they want. <laughs> so, you know, educating people on those simple things or like what Christina was talking about with trauma, uh, Christina, or I, I can't remember if it was Christina or Jesse, but talking about trauma and how important that is for people to understand what happens when somebody is homeless and how it affects them. And I think something like 50% of all people who are homeless have a, tra a traumatic brain injury. So, uh, there's just a lot to, for people to learn, and it's important that we continue to share it with them. And so what I would say for people here is really sharing information with your community and continuing to talk about this and have conversations with them. Great. Um, I guess we kind of figured 15 minutes for questions at the end, which puts us about three minutes ahead. I don't know if there's any like a, uh, anything else the panelists here um, thought of that they wanted to talk about, um, spend a couple minutes on that we missed um, before we go into questions. 
not putting you on the spot or anything. I'm just giving you the opportunity if something had triggered while we were going through these. So, okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, well, we can just now open it up to um, everyone and throwing out questions. Um, you can also put it into the chat if you'd like, if that is better for you. Oh, here's one right here. Okay. Yeah, so Lisa with LifeSpring um, says, can anyone speak to how this program works or doesn't for unaccompanied youth? Yeah, um, I can take that if that's okay. Sure. Um, so when, when a single individual gets spedatted, if they're 25 or above, um, they'll be a single adult, but there is a youth spedat. Um, for youth, for our purposes though, it's for folks that are 18 to 24. Um, unfortunately, there is not housing that exists where landlords will um, let a youth under 18 sign a lease. Um, on top of that, there's also lots of liability challenges that happen when you work with a minor. Um, and a lot of agencies don't have the capacity certifications and licensures to do that. It just, just in case somebody doesn't know what spedatting, it's the VI spedat um, vulnerability index tool that uh, Betsy had talked about earlier and, and that's how they, um, they assess folks, so. Yeah, so we, I mean, we work with youth. I mean, if we identify youth that um, we want to work with as far as like how many youth, we will identify youth 18 to 24 years old. And we do make that, you know, when we talk about how many people we want to serve this year in the program, we talk about families, individuals, and youth, and that's what we mean. And the only quick thing I'll say on unaccompanied minors is she's correct. It's a legality thing, uh, something that we've been working on a little bit. Not really much you can do to get them in their own housing. However, shelters can take unaccompanied minors. So in a shelter setting, they can just unfortunately moving them into rapid rehousing would have to wait until they're 18. Okay. Uh... Lindsay um, asks, can any agency that does spadats do them for youth or only certain ones? Or did you just answer that? Sorry. Um. Well, I, I can yeah. sort of speak to that. We do have certain agencies that only do spadats for certain populations. Um, if it's a youth, um, I'm, who does the youth spadats? I'm not, oh, I, I do them, yeah. but uh, do them. again, only for 18 to 24 year olds. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't do youth spadats. We, we just do them a regular spadat if they're 18 to 24. Although I would say the youngest person we've had in our program is probably 21. So, but they're, um, if it's a youth serving agency, they might do them. Um, so it's specific agencies. Yeah, I wonder if Matthew's house does them. I don't know. They might. I don't know either, but that's, I w seems like they would. So, okay. So how do you track clients? So they aren't agency hopping or is agency hopping? Okay. And how do you deal with a family with kids that have been evicted from every housing help they have been in? That was Beth Ball. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer that. Um, so we don't see agency hopping as a bad thing. It is a symptom of somebody who's got trauma um, because they're trying to get needs met and they've learned how to do that in a way, at least this is how my agency views this. Um, and they're trying to get their, their needs met in a way that they, a, a dysfunctional way that they've learned how to get their needs met. Um, so we work with them from a trauma-informed perspective to manage that. If somebody has been evicted multiple times, we will continue to work with them and continue to work on relationships with landlords to try and get them successfully housed. It could also be that the person needs or the family needs a higher level of intervention because they may have more trauma um, and rapid rehousing might not necessarily be the best thing for them. So they might need a voucher to help them stay housed. 
And, and Beth, one thing I, I will say too is, you know, for as far as this FDAP is concerned, there's a way to enter in um, this FDAP now through HMIS, which is a um, collaborative database that all agencies in homelessness for, for the most part use, um, except for DV agencies. We can't enter into HMIS due to the um, security concerns of our of our clients. That being said, if if a, if a client went to um, one agency and they did this for that, um, the other agency could see as long as they were connected to HMIS, they could see that that client had already completed that. Um, and, and to go off of what Betsy said too, when they're, when they're engaging with other agencies, half of our challenge is finding somebody. Half of our challenge is locating someone when they come up for a resource. And so if they are engaging in multiple agencies for different resources, we're okay with that. Thanks. Collaboration is really important. I'll just say mm -hmm. that and we love all working with each other and collaborating and who has the best resources to help any particular client. Sorry, um, this is Shelley with uh, Thompson School District and sorry, I was having a hard time getting admitted for like the first 15 minutes. So you might have already said this, but I had been told earlier in the year, because we work largely with Family Housing Network, that that was the one agency in the area that could issue, could had rapid rehousing, collaboration, grant, whatever, um, for families. And I'm now, I'm aware that ATV, and I'm going to guess probably Crossroads does also, but can you clarify for me? Like Homeward Alliance, is it still just individuals and not families that has the rapid rehousing model? Um, we predominantly work with single adults. Um, we were more or less instructed that if, I mean, if one of the programs that accepts families cannot um, on not very often we can accept families, but we have yet to. Um, we, we've mostly been referred just single adults. Um, and it sounds like, um, or it, it, from what I've been able to gather, uh, a lot of the agencies that deal with families have been able to get people in. Um, I mean, I could be wrong on that, but uh, more or less like we've been told specifically to refer to those family programs um, and on the off chance that, you know, none of the programs can accept, then somebody that is a family can be referred, but we have yet to have that happen. Yeah, and David, we work as well. Huh? I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry, Betsy. I just thought, I didn't know if David had something he wanted to add on that. I did, but you go first, Betsy, because you were about to say, you might Oh, have, I was just going to say. say I was just going to say we serve veteran families. So if you have um, somebody in the school district who has a parent who's a veteran, they could be referred to us for rapid rehousing. Um, what what I was going to say is that, and some of this is sort of a repeat, but um, with with the um, uh, some of the COVID relief dollars that came through first through the CARES Act and then the uh, American Rescue Plan Act, there was a big surge of funding for rapid rehousing programs across the state. Um, that's what funds Homeward Alliance's program. So it's actually so so our program is actually going to expire at the end of August, which is when in, unless there's a renewal of funding, which we haven't heard anything about yet. Um, and uh, Family Housing Network is actually funded through the exact same grant to to support families, um, and 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 so they have been the the primary agency who we've referred families to um, throughout the throughout the pandemic. But again, they're in the same boat where their their rapid rehousing dollars are going to expire in August. So as a as a region. Um, but particularly in Larimer County, which is where most of those COVID relief dollars ended up being directed, there's going to be a pretty significant cliff effect at the end of August with um, uh, rapid rehousing supportive dollars um, um, slipping away. We're working with a few different stakeholders to try to extend it, um, but we're talking about, um, I mean, this, is a, this, is, this can be a very expensive, very expensive intervention. Um, 
it's, you know, unlike some of our other programs where we're working with people who have housing vouchers or they're getting housed at places like Mason Place or Red Tail Ponds where there's a voucher attached and there isn't an ongoing rent assistance need. Um, in order to continue a program like rapid rehousing, you really need commitments of, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, and so I think the likelihood of us seeing that extended, unfortunately, it gets, it gets, it gets slimmer by the day. Um, we're, we're, we're hopeful, but uh, long term as a region, if we really want to have um, widespread, robust, rapid rehousing programs that serve all of the different subpopulations we're trying to serve, then we will need a significant surge in funding from state government, federal government, and local local government. And, and David and Shelly, to answer um, a little bit previously that you had brought up, um, the grant, the funding will dicta dictate who we, who we serve. So each agency, when, when they write their grant, will be somewhat of a tenant selection plan. ATV will only serve households in our rapid rehousing program that are actively fleeing from domestic violence or are currently homeless due to domestic violence. Um, certain agencies only serve certain populations such as families and, and, and that's okay. We have the ability and flexibility in our program to serve any population as long as they're fleeing domestic violence. Um, there are also different categories of homelessness too that play a part in what other housing programs can accept. And Shelly, as far as referral and thing, keep in mind that um, up to between 50 and 60% of uh, homeless women and children are homeless due to DV situation. So it's not uncommon. Am I right with what I said in the chat there that it's Homeward Alliance Family Housing Network and Crossroads Safe House that have the COVID relief funded domestic, uh, I'm sorry, rapid rehousing programs? Yeah, we yes. didn't, we didn't get any CV money. Okay. So those are the three that are at, at Je in jeopardy. Crossroads has other funding sources for rapid rehousing, though. Yeah, I think the ones that are much more, yeah, you're right. The ones that are really likely to just sort of disappear are Family Housing Network and Homeward Alliance. And that's why a lot of what, what Christine is doing now is trying to wind down the program and make sure that folks who aren't going to be able to sustain rent on their own are um, uh, have access to vouchers or refer to other, you know, permanent supportive housing programs if that's, if that's what they need. So the goal is that, you know, at the end of August, um, everyone who needs to be referred out to a different program is, and everyone who has the ability to pay for their rent ongoing has started to do that. I think, you know, the other thing, and one thing that's really important, but uh, the pandemic just threw a wrench into it, is that when somebody comes into a rapid rehousing program, it's really important from the time you do an intake with them, that you start the exit conversation with them. This is not long-term services. And that we use something called critical time intervention, where essentially the first few months you're working with them to just get them stabilized into housing. The next few months, they sort of try things on their own and then you get them out into the community and doing things on their own so that they're exited within a timely manner um, and that they're able to sustain things on their own. But the pandemic really threw a wrench into that, especially because we had no more limits on how much we could spend, at least with my grants, um, it was ongoing. In fact, it's still ongoing and it's created some problems. So we're working really hard to um, have those conversations with people now and, and cost sharing is really important. Um, you know, Christina said that when people come in, all they hear is, yes, I want, you know, the housing piece. Yes, I want the housing, but the, there's a lot to it. And so really having those conversations with them up front about that it's not an ongoing process is important. Um, <clears throat> just somebody asked what my, the name of my program is. It's SSVF, and we have two of them, one in Weld County and one in Larimer County. It's with Volunteers of America. And then we also have a program called Colorado Rapid Rehousing uh, Reentry and Colorado Core Plus, uh, which is an extension of that program. And that one just fun functions in Weld County. The, the, the core program that I mentioned is across Larimer and Weld. Um, that has very specific requirements to it that include criminal justice and referrals have to come through the Department of Corrections. Um, they can also come from other justice partners and through our coordinated entry system. And it has a mental health and substance use component to it as well. 
All right, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. Let's see. Lindsay, does the rapid uh, rapid rehousing definition of DV include parental abuse or just IPV? Um, she works with several unaccompanied accompanied youth. I don't know why I have trouble saying that word. Um, home that are homeless due to abuse of home situations that don't necessarily include IPV. It means intimate partner violence. Yes, we have worked with youth who have had to flee domestic violence from their parents. Uh, again, as long as they're above 18. Now, uh, and I, I do want to make sure to clarify that just because someone is bedatted and, and is the, in the range, there also has to be an opening um, for, for them in the, in the programs that are in existence. And so we haven't had an opening in our program for a few months now. We will, we will soon with renewal of funding. But um, that being said, just because someone is bedatted, even in that range, it doesn't mean that there's going to be an opening for them. A lot of times when I used to that people, I will tell them to forget we even did it um, unless they get housed or their contact information changes. So Jesse, that might answer one of the questions that I had because it's Shelly again with Thompson School District. Um, so we have had a number of folks that are coming out of either Crossroads or ATV and I have wondered uh, why they haven't been in rapid rehousing or why Family Housing Network couldn't help them. So I have various theories. One of them being, I wondered if they didn't have the right VI SPDAT st score, but it sounds like... And, and Shelly, I, I just want to make very clear that we don't tell clients that there's a score attached to that assessment. Um, that is... Uh, uh, something that we don't, we do, we, I actually will, may tell them that it's not a housing application, that it's a vulnerability assessment, but they do not understand, or it's very important that they don't know that there's a score attached to that, because it creates a lot of problems within the system otherwise, if that happens. So um, please make sure to not spread that information. That's, that's good to know. And so it's generally, if they are leaving shelters, do we assume that everyone has been VI spedatted? I will, if as long, I mean, so historically, um, I'm leaving at the end of the month, I'm leaving on the 31st. And so historically with me being here, what I have done is met with everybody at the, um, in the community, in our various programs and in our safe house for domestic violence. Um, the great thing about the, uh, this is gonna sound really bad, for domestic violence households, they can still technically be in housing with an abusive partner and get spedatted. In the general community, they have to be homeless for two weeks, literally homeless, that's in shelters or on the streets before even being considered for a spedat. So as, as a DV agency, we have some flexibility to work with people um, that are still in housing. And what's even better is moving somebody that's in a domestic violence household directly into new housing without them having to go to shelter. For me, in my mind, that's a diversion, um, diverting people away from shelter. Thank you so much, Jesse. I just really wanna interject really quick. I know that we hit the hour, and so I just wanna be mindful of people's time. If there's, if there's an additional question, you can hang on, but it, for those who have meetings to go to, they can drop off. We may be done with questions, but I just wanted to be mindful of the time, so. Um. Doesn't sound like there is anything additional. So yeah, thank you so much everybody for attending. You know, um, just this education piece is such a huge part of, you know, of the reason why we're doing these uh, trainings. And so just spread the word, talk about it and always feel free to reach out to people if you have questions. Um, so we really appreciate your time coming and and um, learning with us so and thank you for all of you the panelists um, Betsy and Jesse and Carrie and Christina thank you so much for taking your time to to be here today and share share the information so